good afternoon to all. So my name is François Roger, CFO. Joined Nestlé four years ago. So my presentation is the last uh, one of the day before we move to the uh, to the Q and A. Just to avoid any expectation, my presentation does not contain any photo or any video, uh, only numbers and good numbers. Um, just uh, I will cover five uh, topics today. I will start with an update on our progress towards our 2020 targets. Then I will cover in depth capital allocation and return on invested capital. And I will cover briefly earning per share on capital structure. Two years ago, we set ambitious targets for ourselves uh, for 2020. Uh, we are halfway into, uh, into the journey now, and we are on track to deliver our 2020 targets. Starting with the uh, top line, we have already seen some progress in our organic growth last year and further progress in the first quarter of 2019, where we landed at 3.4%. And as far as the bottom line is concerned, we improved our underlying trading operating profit by 100 basis points over the last uh, two years. There are still some factors that could influence the exact landing for next year, starting with uh, commodity pricing and potentially uh, needs for reinvestment in our uh, own business. We have led the foundation over the last two years in order to uh, get to our 2020 targets and everything that we have done over the last two years will also contribute to uh, our profitable growth agenda for 2019 and 2020. And I will walk you through some of this uh, item in the next couple of slides. Starting with our portfolio, which is clearly geared for profitable growth. We have a certain number of profitable growth drivers. The three main ones are our high growth categories, emerging markets and premium products. High growth categories, you know them, coffee, pet care, water, infant nutrition, and consumer health care. Uh, they account for 57% of our sales. Emerging markets, they contribute around 43% of our sales. Uh, we are very pleased with the uh, recent development that we have seen in China, mid-single digit, in uh, Brazil, double digit, or I could mention as well Russia, which was double digit in, uh, in Q1, and uh, India as well, just to name a few. And premium products, uh, it accounts for 22% of our sales. It grows at uh, more than two times the average of the, of the group in terms of organic growth. Premium products will account for 22% of our sales today. It was 11% uh, six years ago. All of these uh, three uh, growth drivers, not only do they contribute to our top line growth, but they contribute to our margin improvement as well given that each and every single of these drivers have a margin which uh, underlying trading operating profit, margin which is above 18%. Portfolio management is also contributing to growth. We set an objective uh, two years ago of, uh, to rotate about 10% of our portfolio by 2020. By the middle of 2019, in a couple of uh, months, we should be around 9%, uh, if I take into consideration the businesses that are under review, which clearly indicate the fact that we are likely to land at a higher level than our original target. What is also interesting to note is the fact that the businesses that we have sold so far had negative growth, while the businesses that we bought had last year, on average, 12% uh, organic growth. We are working very actively uh, to increase our gross margin, and our gross margin has increased in five out of the last six years. We are acting on all levers, and you have the list of all the levers there. I'm not going to cover all of them individually. I'll just mention more specifically two of them. Pricing, for example, even if we had a limited price, um, price uh, level over the last couple of years, we have been able to hold prices or even to increase moderately pricing when commodity pricing went south. I would like to mention as well industrial productivity. Last year, we reduced our fixed factory overhead by about 2.5%. When we compare that against our organic growth at about 3%, at 3%, this means that we increased, uh, in terms of productivity in one single year, we increased our productivity on the uh, industrial side by about 5%. To, uh, three years ago, we shared with you our saving program, which at that time was 1.8 billion, with the ambition to take away this 1.8 billion Swiss franc of our p l by 2020. We have reviewed that program uh, upwards since then to between 2 and 2.5 billion for uh, next year. And obviously, there are different momentum and dynamics uh, between the uh, three components, procurement. We have already delivered 90% of it. Uh, this was expected because we started earlier. 
We will probably deliver, as far as procurement is concerned, probably even more than the original objective. While in manufacturing, we indicated uh, originally that this will be more backloaded, given the complexity of uh, some of these topics and the need that we need in order to uh, address it. So there is no specific issue with the fact that we are at around 30%. Just want to mention as well that uh, GNA includes distribution cost as well, because we will probably talk about it with uh, DSD. So overall, we are at uh, around 50%. Just want to mention as well the fact that uh, this saving program does not necessarily stop in 2020. We are already starting to work on a certain number of initiatives, new initiatives, that will impact our cost base as well post-2020. Our business model is not based on an aggressive cost-cutting uh, model. It's based on a combination of growth and cost discipline. This is what we have been doing over the last two years. If you look at 17 and 18 combined, we actually increased our reported sales even after foreign exchange by about 2%. At the same time, we reduced our structural cost by 2%. This combination allowed us to increase our underlying trading operating profit by 100 basis points. So it looks relatively simple, but for example, to reduce our structural cost is not always easy because we have inflation in some markets and we have ne the need to reinvest in uh, some other areas as well, like digital that we mentioned earlier. We keep on building new plants. Laurent indicated, for example, uh, shared with us the uh, plant that he's investing upon. Um, this uh, model of uh, the combination of growth and cost discipline is what we will continue to do as well for 2019 and 2020. To get there, we need to invest in uh, restructuring. That's what we did. We raised our restru restructuring spending over the last two years to around 700 million Swiss francs per annum. And this is the amount that uh, we provided as a guidance for 2019. Just want to mention there that the 700 million does include whatever we need to invest for DSD, this project that we announced this morning. Uh, it has been uh, mentioned by Steve this morning that uh, this afternoon or this morning that there were 500 million of one-off costs. So this 500 million of one-off cost includes 200 million of restructuring, which are included in this 700 million for 2019. So totally uh, confirming the original guidance, and you have another 200 million. Uh, sw uh, Swiss francs, which correspond to impairment of assets, essentially around trucks and distribution centers that we have. And there is about 100 million that corresponds as well to uh, onerous contracts, for example, which are restructuring related expenses, but not booked under the line, in the line restructuring per se. Um, the, let me move now to my next topic, which is capital allocation. Uh, there, we are always tri uh, trying to strike the right balance between deploying capital for profitable growth, be it organic growth or inorganic growth, m and on the one hand, or on the other hand, returning capital to shareholders, either in the form of a progressive and a sustainable dividend or in the form of share buyback. What I will do in the next couple of slides is to uh, walk you through our thinking process and our review process whenever we review these matters and whenever we discuss these matters as well with the board of directors. Starting with the investment for profitable growth, which takes different shapes and form, whenever we review individual projects, uh, we always review the, the uh, strategic merits of these projects and we benchmark them and compare them against the risk and the return on an individual basis. We have actually fairly clear views and expectations in terms of targeted payback as far as efficiency program and restructuring program is concerned, and as far as CAPEX program is concerned, which, which are indicated there. Uh, as far as R&D and marketing is concerned, it's a little bit more complicated, and I know that there was a question about it this morning. It's, we are really focusing much more on reducing time to market, as Stefan and Patrice explained this morning. The concept of payback is a little bit more complicated by the, uh, given the nature of this project, some of them will have a short return, some of them will have a long return, uh, but we are always reviewing, once again, the strategic merit, the risk, and the return, but it's a little bit more complicated to measure for R&D. We have, overall, strengthened considerably the governance around this project, and we have uh, managed to reduce, as a consequence, the average payback of this project. As far as m and is concerned, the, um, we look at a certain number of KPIs. Uh, the main one is uh, ROIC, where we have fairly clear views of what we want to achieve over the medium term. Obviously, the uh, timing of the return is longer. 
but it brings another dimension, which is the strategic dimension, and it gives us access to um, businesses and platforms that we cannot necessarily develop internally. We have accelerated, as you know, the uh, level of uh, M&A transaction. Last year, we completed about 14 billion Swiss francs of transaction, and this year, we will probably do a sizable amount as well, essentially around the Nestle Skin Health and ERTA, for whatever we have uh, disclosed for the time being. Uh, when we look at M&A, uh, we are always looking at three main uh, KPIs. The uh, strategic fit, we are looking at financial returns, as I in indicated earlier, and we are looking as well at the cultural fit. Moving to uh, dividend, which is another capital option, we do not have a dividend policy per se. We have a dividend practice for a sustainable and progressive dividend. We have actually increased our dividend for 24 years in a row in Swiss francs. And uh, just want to walk you through the, uh, the thinking process there. When we uh, review that and discuss it with the board of directors, we look at a certain number of KPIs, starting with underlying EPS growth, moving into uh, comparables in our industry. I'm talking there of dividend yield or dividend payout uh, practiced in our industry. We are looking at uh, other external factors like foreign exchange, and we are very much looking at the exchange rate of the Swiss francs, given that there is an imbalance between the currency of payment of our dividend, Swiss francs, and the main trading currencies that we have, which are more US dollar and Euro denominated. So we need to take that factor into account. Uh, we are also looking at uh, strategic items like m and flexibility, as well as uh, share buyback. Talking of uh, share buyback, we have uh, launched six programs since 2005. We have returned uh, more than 60, 60, 60 billion Swiss francs of uh, value through our, to our shareholders as a consequence of that. And we often have the question about the uh, relevance of conducting this program at a certain price point uh, in terms of uh, share price. You can see that at least historically, uh, we created uh, significant value through these uh, share buyback programs. We started in 2005 uh, buying shares at 36 Swiss francs. The last program that we completed, we did it at 71 Swiss francs on average. Or even the current program, we are currently around 82 for what we have bought two thirds of the program uh, to be compared with our current share price, which is around 97 or 98. So you can see that we have created value. Obviously, when we conduct these programs, we always uh, look at our outlook and we are always positive. We have a positive outlook of the future of our business. Moving to my next topic, which is uh, return on invested capital. Um, we know that uh, shareholders have a significant interest for our OIC. So do we. It is now embedded into uh, both our short-term and long-term incentive programs. So we have a vested interest in looking at it as well. We are actively working on it, looking at the numerator, profitable growth, and looking at the denominator, our asset base. Uh, if we look at the uh, numerator, profitable growth already covered most of it. This is about driving our high growth categories and geographies. This is about uh, managing our cost base with discipline. Asset productivity, we are very much uh, very careful as far as uh, industrial asset is concerned. Uh, we are very careful as well about uh, CapEx, and I will show you some examples of the progress we have made. We are looking very carefully at our real estate uh, base as well, reducing our working capital, and I will show you some of the examples. We are very careful as well in terms of M&A. Uh, we know, by the way, the largest value that we have in our balance sheet is our goodwill and intangible, which is north of 50 billion Swiss francs. So we are very disciplined there. Just for your information, over the last two years, we looked at 35 billion Swiss francs of transaction value, uh, even that we discussed with the board of directors. So it's not just about looking. And that we decided not to pursue, essentially by lack of financial return. That did not prevent us, though, from doing 14 billion of deals. Just to answer one question that I heard today about the largest coffee asset that we bought. Uh, was it too expensive? I just want to mention that we bought it at a, net debt, at a EBITDA multiple of 15 times, uh, which, in my opinion, is very reasonable when we look at uh, market transactions today. And I'm very confident, especially for a gross assets, because we have large opportunities to grow uh, outside of the original footprint of this asset. I'm very confident that we will deliver value there. Just to come back to the uh, denominator and through the example of CapEx, uh, we have strengthened the governance there. We have been able to reduce the amount of uh, CapEx without threatening at all 
our uh, growth opportunities. We have focused the CAPEX very much on our high growth categories, which uh, focus where we have about two thirds of our CAPEX now uh, spent in uh, these categories. And we have strengthened the governance, uh, reducing significantly the, uh, the payback over the last uh, couple of uh, quarters. To do, do that, what we did is we, we increased uh, significantly the accountability, including at executive level. We reduced the time of execution of these projects. And um, what we did as well is to uh, make sure that we right size these projects and uh, build uh, reasonable uh, assets and plants, for example, and equipment. So good, uh, good progress there. You know the progress that we did on working capital. I'm sharing that with you on a regular basis. We reduced our working capital very significantly. Last year, we ended up at 1.4% uh, of sales. We have been able to free up around 7 billion Swiss francs of uh, cash. As a consequence, we are clearly trending towards zero. Uh, that's not a guidance. That's uh, an ambition that we have internally. I just want to mention that we have uh, clearly identified the building blocks to uh, get there. Most of uh, what we have achieved over the last couple of years came from payables as well. Uh, part of it uh, is linked to the consolidation of our procurement activities above markets. Uh, as a consequence of everything that, uh, that I showed uh, to you, so we are clearly ticking all boxes as far as the return of invested capital is concerned. Whatever had to go up went up. I'm talking of sales growth, margin improvement, for example. Whatever had to go down, like working capital or capex went down. And you can see as a result of that, that uh, we saw our return on invested capital increasing for each and every single of the last four years to 12.1%. So we are uh, reasonably happy with it. Um, now moving to my next topic, which is underlying EPS. We often talk of uh, the action that we are taking to improve our underlying trading operating profit, but we do work as well on all the items that are below UTOP, starting with finance costs. We are uh, managing our tax base in a responsible way. We are actively working on JVs and associates. I would mention there the superb work that we have done jointly with our partner with uh, Fronery where we have created significant uh, value. Um, the uh, development of our underlying EPS is actually quite nice. We see uh, good progress there over the last uh, couple of years. Just want to point uh, to uh, mention two points though. The fact that it is large, partly influenced by foreign exchange. Uh, you see the negative value in 2015. It is actually due uh, the consequence of the uh, revaluation of the Swiss francs at the beginning of 2015 by about 10% against uh, most uh, currencies. So that's the first thing that I want to mention, which you see um, illustrated by the fact that our uh, underlying EPS grew 4% uh, on average over the last couple of years. But if we take it at constant exchange rate, it was actually an increase of 7%. The other thing I want to mention is the fact that uh, last year, our underlying EPS was positively impacted as well by the US tax reform, which contributed 300 basis points out of the 13.1% in 2018. Uh, moving now to capital structure. Uh, there we have done quite a lot of work as well to uh, build a more efficient capital structure, starting with a lower share count. It's quite impressive to see that we have reduced the number of shares by uh, about 25% since 2003, so which is quite a significant decline. We have increased as well our debt, amount of debt. Uh, we are, I think, close to 40 billion as we speak, with a net debt to EBITDA ratio that was at 1.6 times at the end of last year. We should probably be around that level. And we have also, obviously, um, reduced our rating. We used to be AAA, now we are AA or even AA minus with one of the rating agencies. We did that by increasing our debt, uh, taking the opportunity to increase the average maturity of our debt to uh, north of um, five years, and which is a good way as well to secure liquidity. And we have been able to do that at a very reasonable cost of debt on average this uh, last year. It was at 2.1%. Might be slightly higher this year, but uh, still very reasonable. Just a couple of words on our 2019 guidance and 2020 targets. No change. Uh, as far as 2019 is concerned, no change versus what we said at the beginning of the year. Once again, the 700 million of restructuring does include um, all the uh, consideration that is required for the DSD project that we announced uh, this morning. And as far as 2020 is concerned, so we confirm our target both on the top line and the bottom line. That includes as well 
the uh, DSD exit that we announced uh, earlier the today. That includes as well the assumption that we are making of a likely disposal of uh, the two businesses under strategic review, uh, namely uh, Nestle Skin Health and uh, ERTA. Just for your information, we don't disclose the individual impact of these three items, DSD, uh, Nestle Skin Health and ERTA. Just for your information, uh, these three items combined will have a slight negative impact on OG and will have a slight positive impact on UTOP. But once again, this is factored in our 2020 target. Just to clarify as well what has been mentioned this morning for DSD, that's for only for DSD, we will lose between 19 and 20, probably predominantly in 20, uh, between 400 and 500 million of sales, essentially through the discount that we have to uh, provide to uh, retailers uh, due to the fact that they are taking over some activities. Uh, that will largely not impact our organic growth because we are considering, as per our APM, or alternative performance measurement, we are resetting or reclassif um, restating the previous year, uh, given that it is assimilated to a change of business model. Just don't want to go into the technical uh, items and technicality of it, but if you have any further questions, I'm happy to take them uh, after the session. But just so be aware of the fact that it will not impact materially or organic growth uh, this year or next year. So uh, just to conclude my presentation, uh, so we are confirming our 2020 targets. Uh, we have a clear, uh, very clear views and uh, very uh, disciplined policies as far as capital allocation is concerned. We have increased significantly the focus on the governance around ROIC and uh, EPS with uh, already uh, interesting results. And we have made some progress as well to arrive at a more optimized and efficient capital structure. That concludes my presentation.